couple of years ago, I uh, did a piece of consulting work for a large multinational company, which will remain nameless. Uh, I charged them 5,000 pounds. I sent off the invoice, 30 days to be paid. I received the money two years later. For the first six months, I didn't even register that was a problem, and then I realized that this was an unpaid invoice, so I started chasing this company. And my wife helped me out. She helped me to run the business. We called call centers in India, in Poland, in Scotland, uh, various parts of the accounts payable department of this company, uh, London headquarters. Everybody was very polite. I'm sorry we haven't paid your invoice. Nobody questioned for a second that this invoice needed to be paid. They were all completely powerless to actually do anything about it. There had been a glitch somehow, and the invoice had fallen into a, into a bit of a black hole, and no one could retrieve it. If I'd been doing the work for a small company, the chief executive could have got out his checkbook in the old days. I guess today he would probably get out his mobile phone and just transfer the money, money immediately. But because it was a big multinational, nobody had the authority to actually make such an action. Did I get angry at this state of affairs? No, I became fascinated. I became fascinated that this huge company with profits in the billions couldn't pay a 5,000 pound invoice. And the question I asked myself was, who is accountable for this problem? Is it the person I did the original piece of work for? He was deeply embarrassed. He was apologetic, but of course he was powerless to do anything about it. And all he could do really was just to sort of tell me to speak to somebody else. Was it the accounts payable department or process who were accountable? Yes, at some level they were, absolutely were. That was why we were calling Poland and Scotland and India. But we never found out who the individual, who shall we say, was responsible for that process was. Some of the people didn't know. Others were probably deliberately keeping him or her out of, out of our way, as it were. Perhaps it's the person right at the top, the chief executive, the chief financial officer. Ultimately, everything goes back to that individual. But of course, that person's got rather bigger things to worry about than my 5,000 pound invoice. So as I thought about the problem, I realized that but they were all accountable, but none of them were accountable. None of them felt any accountability. They had outsourced the problem to me. They had outsourced the problem to a third party who wasn't even part of that company. Was the money eventually paid? Yes, it was. And the reason it was paid, I still to this day don't know exactly how it got paid. I think somebody, shall we say, took pity on me and found a way of putting in a little bit of extra effort to find the source of the problem. But the reason I tell you this story, of course, is an illustration of this massive problem of our time, which is that we create these huge corporations which are complex. They are incredibly complex by design, and there's nothing wrong with some level of complexity in the business world, but the trouble with complexity is it creates a deficit of accountability. It's very easy for people to fall back on formal rules and procedures and not take any responsibility for what happens. When you see these famous examples of corporate scandals, it's a very different story than somebody not paying their invoice. But in some ways, the root causes are similar because we have big companies like Wells Fargo, like Volkswagen, like all the companies during the financial crisis where bad stuff happened because people didn't feel personal accountability. We blame the chief executives, and to some extent, that's rightly so. But many of these chief executives were genuinely oblivious to the problems that were happening three or four or five levels below them. So we've got this problem of complexity. We create companies that are too big to fail, but at the same time, they're also too complex to manage. And for me, this is a problem that we need to find a way of addressing. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 10 minutes. The starting point for that investigation about how to overcome the problems of complexity is the following. Should we fight complexity with complexity? If we are operating in a global business world with clients in multiple countries, should we create complex matrix structures to serve their needs? At some level, that feels like an attractive way of doing it. And there's a whole bunch of academic theory that says that's a good thing to do. I believe that that's the wrong approach because it creates all the problems we've been talking about. It's slow, it's inert, it's uh, demotivating, 
It lacks creativity. Instead, we should be pushing in exactly the opposite direction. We should be fighting complexity with simplicity. What do I mean by that? I mean we should be deliberately finding ways of increasing the accountability and ownership, lower down our organisations, simplifying our structures in order that people have the discretion to make the right decisions, to pay the £5,000 that they owe me and to make the right judgement calls on issues of a moral or ethical basis. The metaphor I like to use here is one of traffic system design. And many of us have travelled in many parts of the world and we've seen different approaches to how to manage the traffic systems in the world. And the choice comes down to essentially, on the left side, a complete free-for-all. Uh, when we've got too many cars on the road, a free-for-all leads to complete gridlock. On the, the right-hand side, we have the, the traffic cop. And around the traffic cop, we've got the traffic lights, and we've got the one-way systems, and we've got the markings in the road. Everything is done to order. On the right-hand side, we follow the rules, and we can essentially ignore any sort of thoughts about what we should do for ourselves. It turns out in that debate and that sort of conversation, there have been some innovations. And one that I'd just like to point, you, point out to you is, is a famous one from Holland, a gentleman called Hans Mondermann. He came up with this notion of shared space. You can see a beautiful example of shared space there, where they've got rid of the, the distinction between the cyclists, the pedestrians, and the cars. It's all open space. It is a free-for-all. Indeed, Exhibition Road, just immediately outside this building, is another such example of shared space. The shared space model basically says, if we take away the structures and we assume a certain level of smartness and you know, rule of law in a country or in a place, we will allow everybody to figure out for themselves the right way of getting to this intersection. And Hans Monum proved that very quickly a set of emergent norms of behaviour take place, whereby everybody gets through this intersection quicker than if it's paved with traffic lights and signals and markings and so forth. So that is the metaphor that I think we need to apply to the organisational world. We need to start using this shared space concept within our organisations. So that leads me to a particular point of view about overcoming the costs of complexity through alternative organising models. We all understand that bureaucracy, you know, not without its merits as an organizing method, bureaucracy is the source of inertia and slowness and, and dis, de demotivation in the way that work gets done in large companies. What is the alternative to bureaucracy? Well, one very popular emerging concept is the notion of meritocracy. What is a meritocracy? It's an organizing model where rather than falling back on rules and procedures for doing everything, or falling back on just listening to our boss, we are actually privileging knowledge and expertise and judgment. In a meritocracy, the smartest people actually are the ones that make decisions. And we try to make sure that everyone understands what needs to be done through debate and discussion. That is what a meritocracy does. Unfortunately, meritocracies can also be a little bit slow. Uh, you think of it in terms of analysis paralysis. We've all been in meetings where we decided that we would try to get to the bottom of things by just having a very long debate around it. We tried to build consensus. I work at London Business School. You know, when we don't know what to do at London Business School, we form a committee. And after nine months and four to four, five meetings of that committee, we've essentially figured out what the problem was, but we've actually changed nothing. It's a very, very common scenario in professional services companies in universities. Meritocracy, not bad, but it's not the end of the story. So what is next? I believe that we should give it a name. Another name I like is ad hocracy. Ad hocracy privileges action, okay? In a bureaucracy, we're privileging formal position and status. In a meritocracy, we're privileging knowledge Ad hocracy says that when we don't know the right way forward, the best thing to do is to actually do something, is to actually take action, to experiment, to try something out, build a prototype, talk to our customers to understand what really their needs might be. And then going back to my story about my unpaid invoice, in an ad hocracy, somebody takes responsibility for helping me to solve that problem. That is ad hocracy. It is not falling back on rules. 
Now, what does ad hocacy look like in practice? It has many, many guises. Okay, the whole thing, the purpose of this concept is that it is designed to, be designed to be an overarching way of looking at the world. And ad hocacy, a classic example would be the famous Apple Macintosh. Many of you have heard this story many times before. Steve Jobs took a bunch of his brightest engineers. He put them in a separate building at the far end of the Apple campus. They were pirates above corporate law. Their job was essentially just to create the world's greatest computer in a ridiculously short period of time. And of course, they, they succeeded. They transformed the way that we think about computers today. So that's a classical example of a special team created to do this. A very contemporary example um, is ING Bank uh, in the Netherlands. Um, ING Bank has tens of thousands of employees. Their central office is in the Netherlands, 3,500 people. They took it upon themselves two years ago to say, as we try to reinvent ourselves for a, a digital world, for an omni-channel operating environment, we need to have a completely new way of organizing. They took 3,500 people and they broke them down into 10-person agile teams. It's a form of self-organizing where the teams are the unit of analysis. They own their particular customers, their particular challenges. Their job is to figure out how to work. There is a structure above them to keep them in place, but ultimately, those teams are completely accountable for their users and their customers. And we know that many technology companies have gone down this route of creating so-called agile systems. But this is the first time I've seen a traditional bank, of all things, reinventing itself in this agile way. Just for avoidance of doubt, the whole bunch of stuff around compliance and legal stuff and regulatory affairs, that was left in a traditional structure. That was left as a bureaucracy. They took the rest of the organization. That's the bit that became the ad hocracy. So that is my key message, is that increasingly in today's fast-paced business world, we run the risk of getting stuck in analysis paralysis because we're almost in love with this sort of flow of information that's washing over us. For me, the companies that succeed in the future, of course they will do analysis, they will use analytics, they will use big data, but what they will do more than anything else is they will put a premium on decisive action, that is the arrow point here, and it will be infused with what I call emotional conviction. They will not be afraid of falling into a discussion around intuition and gut feeling and emotional belief wrapped around an understanding of the hard data. So we need formal structure in companies, we need knowledge, but action and ad hocracy must be the sort of decisive part of the story. Now, my final few minutes, let me just acknowledge the challenges of doing this for us as individuals. What does this mean for us as individuals working in these large companies? Ad hocacy is a certain set of behaviors. It's about initiative taking, it's about experimentation and collaboration. These are skills that many of us have. This is the world of entrepreneurship and enterprise. And of course, it's a slightly challenging set of skills and behaviors to coexist within a large company. We all know about people like Elon Musk these days, these unreasonable people who actually have a point of view which does not co coincide neatly with the way that everybody thinks. We need to find a place for the Elon Musks of this world to find a home for themselves within our companies in order for this ad hocracy notion to actually take off. And that's difficult because these people are subversive, they are mavericks, they have to be allowed to fail as often as they succeed. And as leaders of such people, our job absolutely is to find ways of nurturing them. So what we actually need, it turns out, for this new ad hocracy like model to work is we actually need ambidextrous leaders. We need leaders who are on the one hand extremely good at empowering people, getting others to take responsibility, to trust the gut feeling of the people who are working for us, providing support and assistance, giving them what we all often call psychological safety. But at the same time, as such leaders, we have to be prepared occasionally to step in and act decisively ourselves. Jeff Bezos at Amazon, of course, is a very famous example of somebody who doesn't just leave things to his team, neither does he only act on the data. He's often making these sort of gut-wrenching decisions about taking Amazon in a new direction. So for, to succeed in this very fast-paced world, the leaders of the future have to be able to do these two different things 
equally well. So to summarize, the classical bureaucracy, this multinational company that I mentioned at the start, uh, it's, there's a place for bureaucracies. There's absolutely a place for these things to happen. But there is a risk that they become very, very slow and inert and they make our lives difficult and they are unable to do even ordinary things well. The meritocracy has a place. There are many knowledge-intensive companies out there that actually require this sort of debate and deliberation that is necessary for success. But increasingly, I believe we need to start thinking in terms of infusing our organizations with a great deal more of an action mindset, an ad hocracy, as I call it, which is about flexibility and decisiveness, where people feel that they have the freedom, the discretion, to take judgments based on their own personal accountability. For me, the firms that succeed in the future will have overcome these costs of complexity by essentially building organic, self-organizing systems where that sort of initiative and entrepreneurship is encouraged. Thank you.